that all of you or some of you are from Pontus, right? Okay. Uh, let me make this simple so we can discuss things. You know, every time I come over here and talk to you people, I bring a paper and then I read from the paper the information. Right? This time, since we're going to be talking about Ponopean family changes, we, I will start by opening a discussion on this. And then after that, if we have time, then we can move on to the content of the paper that I brought with me. But before that, there is some background information that, uh, you know, I wrote this, started writing this small booklet about 2004. And, you know, sometimes I stop and do other things. But uh, this is called Genealogy of Some Families of Wena. Kitty. Genealogies are the way you depict the family relationship down the line. And then when I started working on this, you know, I thought about if I let this information, you know, to the people to know, uh, they will be able to memorize, but if they don't think about family, it will not make any sense in the long run, right? So we must kind of discuss some Philippine concepts of family and then change it. What, what is the, the most important change that is occurring to the Philippine family now? Uh, and I think this applies to many of us, Chuk also. We know we're all matrilineal, right? We get our identity from our mothers. So my clan membership is from my mother, not from my father. And I think this is true of many of us, except for Yap. Yap may be a little bit different. And so with that in mind, again, the question is, what is the biggest change in the family structure and function in Tonpei and possibly in other parts of the FSM. Can anybody? Guesstimate is also good, it's allowable. <laughs> well, let me, let me just mention this. Uh, we know, we know that the extended or Penene Lao will always be there. We also know that a component of the extended or Penene Lao is Penene Tuk. Smaller family, right? So the change I'm talking about is happening within these two. Emphasis on the function of the Penene Lao or extended family is eroding. And a lot of responsibilities are now shift to Penenaitukutuk or smaller family unit, nuclear family. Mm. Uh, but before we go on to that, who are the members of Penenaitukutuk? I think we better define that before, uh, before we go on. And then who are the members of Penenaitukutuk or smaller family unit? Anybody? Uh, let's start with the nuclear family, smaller ones. Who are the members of that family? Yes, anybody? The parents. Yes, the parents, correct. And the children. And the children, that's true. That's the nuclear family. It's the foundation of the family. And it is like other societies. We have nuclear family. And then we have the extended family system. Now, we know the nuclear family membership. What about the extended family? Who are the members? Okay. Uh, these are in Ponopin, but uh, you, can, you can probably look at it. What I put down is 
father, mother, their children, grandfather, grandmother, the sister and brothers of the grandmother and grandmother, okay, the sister and brothers of your parents, right? Kriyamno uh, no Kalapo, now I mentioned this already, so let's just stop there and say this is our extended family. One thing that is important that we relate to as an extended family is so. Members of the clan are always included somehow in the extended family, right? So, aside from these, you have also the members of the clan, your clan. Uh, what is what is your clan's membership in in in, in the Morlock? Uh, <coughs> Mine is the Outer Islands, the Northwestern Islands, so it's Saw. Saw? Okay. What about, what about you? Is it a chow or something of that? Or? It's, we say Mohunfar. Mohunfar? Okay, so you know your, your clan. And you inherit that from your mother's side, right? Okay, what about Kamu? Nanyak. Nanyak, okay. You know the members of Nanyak clan? They always fall asleep. <laughs> they are known for that. So before I finish my talk, I think she will be, she will be sleeping. <laughs> I'm just kidding. That's one of the uh, very well-known clans in Pompey. Uh, what about you? Sabunipi. Sabunipi. Okay, Sabunipi is the Chuk proper, right? It's also Alderaan. Alderaan. But well, you know what Sabunipi means? It's Sabon Pompey. That is, you people came from. I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad I got me. Okay, that's a noble clan of Madlenium. The Munuai? That's a noble clan of where? Agome. That? We am a support. Support? Yeah, I think same answers. Same answers. Agome. This guy, the Munuai, is very well known oral historian of Pompe. They are found in the southern part of Pompe, especially in Mokot where he works these days. Uh, and they know a lot of local medicine, so be careful, we might play some magic on you. Go on. Okay, so we know, we know our clans, and the clans are always part of the extended family system in our system, right? Now, let, let's go to the more fun things. Okay, what do you call, from your perspective, the sons and daughters of your mother's brother? What is the term you use locally? Oh. And then the sons and daughters of your mother's sister. Sister of your mom, her children. How do you call, what do you call them? Aren't they your cousins? Yes. Don't you use the term cousin these days? <laughs> I cousin now, or that's my cousin, right? Okay, in the Ponopean terminology, we have these Nai, which means uh, somebody that you uh, kind of, uh, your child, right? Riyari, which means siblings. Uh, we also have uh, Nono, Papa, father, mother. Then we have Urilap, right? And then we also have Limasakatil, but that's a special term. And we also have Mane Sak. Okay, these people are within the extended family. Now, remember I pointed out before that the function of the extended family is eroding. So I cannot relate to a function of a Limasakatil. What is your responsibility in a family? And also Ulla, my uncle. I also have my own interpretation, but let me not say it now. Because these days, I think many of us will refer to our mother, our mother's sister and brothers as auntie and uncle, right? 
but also the same on the father's side. Your father's sister and your father's brother are, we are adopting and using the American terms. I cousin love, or that's my cousin, or uh, my uncle, or you know, that's my, we're not using our own terminology. So what is our own terminology for your mother's brother? Your uncle. Okay, in Torpe, that one is reserved for Ullap. Your mother's brother is Ullap. Uh, some people say Ullap is a bad word. I said no. <laughs> yeah. Ullap means your great pillow. That's the person that you support or that will support you. That's what it means. So it's your mother's brother that is referred to as that. Otherwise, your father's brother and, and what not, they're all referred to as Papa. But what is distinguished these from your own biological father? Utanai Papa, that's my biological father. Ivan Papagi, that's my uncle. And we are forgetting about Ivan Papagi. Ullape, we're using my uncle, my papa, my cousin. So the terminology, terminologies are changing. And, and I, I want to bring this up because uh, I think it will intensify as we move on into the future. And I just point out to you that Ullap means a pillow or my pillow. That person is special. That's the person that I will go for advice. That's the person who will give me support, right? Now these are within the extended family, right? What about in the nuclear family? Do you have any such? You have any ulnab? No, not, not, not that we know of. Therefore, the responsibilities of taking care of children are mostly now on the extended family people. Not on the extended, but on the nuclear family. Some of the responsibilities that are uh, supposed to be for the extended family, like uncles, are no longer there. So the shift that I was talking about from extended family to nuclear family is more of a shift of responsibility. The nuclear family would still be there. The extended family would still be there. But the function of the individuals within those areas will change. And I think this is what is happening to us now. And uh, there are two other terms that uh, Kaim and Kainak. Kaim is sub clan, or if you are a member of a clan and there is a sub clan or a lineage within that clan, we call it Kaim or the corner of the, uh, the same as uh, kind of. Okay, who are your parallel cousins? And who are your cross cousins? Uh, from your perspective. So, my parallel cousins are those that we have the same plan? No. Your parallel cousins are those that are the children of your mother's sister mm. and the children of your father's brother. Okay, those are your parallel cousins. And Both our, mother and father? Yeah. On the father's side, it's your father's brother's children. Okay. This is a set of, set of cousins. Eh? On your mother's side, it is your mother's sister's children. Uh, they're known as parallel cousins. Anyway, the other ones are cross cousins. Parallel cousins are important because sexual relationship between members of those are not allowed. They're like siblingship. A sexual relationship between uh, real brothers and sisters is not allowed, it's prohibited. But between parallel cousins, parallel cousins cannot get married. Cross cousins can do that, with some exceptions. Uh, 
on that, but it's allowable. Now, the parent doesn't, you cannot marry them. So, what happens if we lose these terminologies and uh, forget about the relationship that is expected between you and your parallel cousins and you and your cross cousins. We lose that also. So we will be running around, you know, getting married to our people who are taboo, sexual taboos, getting married to our, our, our clan members, for example. My older brother married a person who is from our clan. And my mother was the head of the family at that time. So he got drunk, came and asked for my mother, I want to marry this girl. So the mother found, uh, asked who that person was. She found out that she's a member of our, our clan. She said, no, you're not married then. So he went back and drunk again. Next day he came back and asked the same thing. The mother said, no, that's not allowable. So he said, you know what, I will change my last name from your family's name to a different one, but I'll just go and marry that person. So anyway, people will go to an extreme end so that they can marry the sexual person. Anyway, so these are things that we should know, I think, I hope. And then they are important because family relations, the way you are expected to behave in front of other families, and the way you expect the other family members to behave to you are, are that. So, bear that in mind, it's just an introduction to And now I will read some part of the paper that I wrote. The paper is called The Changing Family Structure and Function. European family in the midst of a universal drama, uh, dilemma. So as it like our God, the family unit provides order, purpose, sense, and emotional security to any society. Yet one can legitimate, legitimately argue today that the family unit is undergoing a great deal of turmoil all around the world. And I want to share with you some of the ideas that I have along this line. I don't have a thesis to defend in this. So changes in the local situation we've discussed, but we will continue to ask why are these changes occurring? For example, shift in function from extended family to the more nuclear family. Can some of you give me any reason why this is happening? What's happening? Why is the shift in function going from? Are we getting stingy? Are we? Money drives up for Yeah. <laughs> yeah I think yeah. it's going from working our how the lifestyle is before, where we depending on the resources of the land. Yes. To the Western jobs or money. Very it's good. Not everyone in the family can yeah. get a job. Right. So it's instead of bringing everything over into you know that main house it's well this is just going to our kitchen this is our house yeah. so now we have a sink now we have a kitchen okay. so the, the local center which is where the one does the food is no longer the main place for the family yeah so we become lap kopo is scattered to grease in a sense uh, i think it has to do with or one reason is the change from the local subsistence prestige economy more or less to the emerging cash economy. And there are more and more people now who are going to school simply because they want to get out and have a good job, earn good living. Uh, and I, I don't, I mean, I'm like that and I think all of you are like that. So. Uh, even if we are critical about these things, we are participating in it. The reason for my talk is just that sometimes you need to stop and think about things. Don't just go headlong into all of this without really knowing some of the consequences of what may happen. 
So that's one reason why this is important. And that's one reason why I think, and you also think, that the shift of function from the extended family is more to the nuclear family now. Nuclear family is the center, socio-economic center. That's where the, the father brought food, just enough for him, his wife, and the children. And there is not enough, I think, now for members of the extended family, as we recalled them before. But one thing is happening now that, that makes me, you know the Micronesians who are out there, or the FSM, the Phonopins? When they get out to the States, they always like to congregate. They get together. It's more like they, they are reviving what was uh, being changed here. In the, so uh, the environment is important. It depends on, on where you are and what you do. And, and the, they have no sense of nationalism until they're away from home. Right, they are away from home. Together. Now they remember that this, these are important for them. Yeah, very good. And, uh, there are two ways. When you think about a family unit, at least I, I think of it in two ways. One is that it's a natural gift to you. It's part of the evolution. You have to get married so you can sustain the humanity, people who are around you a gift from, let's say, the spirits or something of that nature. The other way to think about it uh, is, is a unique way of thinking about it. So the biological environment is not exclusively what determines a family. See, another level, way of thinking about a family, it's unique because the understanding and the response to it are derived from cultural, social, spiritual, and reasoning capacities of humans. I mean, a cow cannot reason, uh, uh, am I going to jump or not? I don't think so. They, they respond to without reasoning, without really thinking about things uh, like, like us. How family members interact with each other and with members of the other families are really controlled pretty much by your cultural process and your social life. So, Humans go beyond natural partnership and establish, for example, marriage rules. I don't just go and pick up my spouse like a dog or, or a cow somewhere. I have, I have to go formally and request with respect that I would like to get married to that. Humans make decision to control the family size, for example. And they regulate family membership through adoption, through clanship, and alliance formation. Only humans possess the capacity to rationalize, to plan, and to respond to their roles, feelings, obligations, and responsibilities as daughters, as sons, as fathers, as mothers, as uncles, as, as aunts, and as clan members. What is, what is the problem? What is the challenge we face now? Okay, let, let me just bring it up. Now, this is a reflection of my thinking. And this is not political, or this is not because I'm religious, or any of that. But you have your choice of making your decisions. What is going to happen if tomorrow we're open to go to a sperm bank and get a sperm to get our children, right? Inseminate the sperm into another lady or into your wife and you get children. Somehow I feel kind of uncomfortable about that. But uh, maybe some of you or have no choice. But you still have to make a decision that is border on, on moral, and other aspects of your humanity, your way of thinking about the world. That's one example. Now, I also read that they have already cloned sheep. That is, they can only get genetic material and they create another sheep that is like that. 
What's going to happen if they can do that to humans? That clone, that clone individual? Uh, how do we define the father and the mother? Who is their father? Who is their mother? Are we going to change all of the terminologies of father, mother, son, daughters, brothers, sisters? If they are cloned running around without knowing any of their relationship to another individual. Uh, this will probably come along with the age of automation. With the age of things that are run by machine and you just keep going and going and going. So uh, I say these things, maybe they are outrageous, maybe they will not happen. But it is important that sometimes you stop what you do and think about things regarding all of these. We are facing uh, the possibility of uh, these things happening to us, maybe not in, in a too distant future. So with that I also discuss what I call artificial societies in this paper. So they are, these societies are found in industrialized countries and some developing countries. Many members of such societies are wage earners who spend more time at the job than at home. I get up in the morning, prepare myself, 8 o'clock I'm in the office at the mercy of somebody or some money that I need to earn. I get up spontaneously, I get in my car, get into the office. Uh, what happened to me? Do I have any self-knowledge? Do I have anything of myself? Or do I, am I responding to something external that I need to do, that I have to do? Many members of such uh, wage earners and they spend more time at the job than at home. On daily basis, on daily basis, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm turning the page and I'm screwing up the term. <laughs> uh, many members of such societies are, okay, on daily basis the majority of the people in such societies spend more hours interacting and communicating with people other than their family members and with one kind of machine or another ranging from automobile to television to computer. Let's imagine I get up in the morning, I get into the car, that's automobile and myself. I get to the office, the first thing I do is turn on the computer and check my email. Myself and the computer. And then the phone ring and myself and the phone. Uh, so, somebody invited me to go and talk about technology and culture next month and I don't know what I'm going to talk about, maybe something like this. But I mean you are spending or we are spending more of our time interacting with not humans but uh, with machines. Mm. So once we were very personal, right? We like face to face. We like to sit around and talk. These days we can just pick up the phone and call somebody. So we're interacting with machines, less personal. We become pretty much impersonal in many of the things that we do. So on daily basis, for example, many decisions are made and actions executed by members of such societies are superficial, I said superficial, but spontaneous. Because they are quickly uh, undertaken in response to other people's decision, my supervisor, the mass media, somebody criticized me on, on uh, let me see, Facebook or something and I respond to that. Uh, and other information from outside. So, superficial or spontaneous decisions and actions may also be undertaken on the basis of analyses and diagnoses made in the, in the hospital, for example, made by machines. I just went to the hospital, what, the other day? And I was nervous just going through all of the tests that they were doing to me. All kinds of machines are hooked up to me 
and it, was, it affects my emotions. And then the next day, I was afraid to go and find out what happened to me. But the person who gave me the exam didn't talk to me much. But he put me under the machines and he gets hooked up with a lot of stuff. So, uh, superficial actions may also be undertaken by analysis, diagnosis, findings and recommendations made or derived from unthinking, not feeling, unreasoning machines. Many members of such societies have experienced sadness, pain, happiness, anguish, anger, and others in response to findings by human-assisted machines or their interaction, their interaction with machines. For example, I get into my car, run down in, I run over a dog. I feel bad. If I run over a human, I feel worse because I am in an automobile. If I walk, nothing is going to happen to me. Anyway. So the members of artificial societies often struggle to find out who they really are. Social constraints have denied them self-knowledge. And societal constraints have disturbed their emotional stability, blurred their reasoning capacity. Human interactions become impersonal and we become more and more dependent on machines for communication, learning and decision making. When these things happen to you, then what is the fate in this situation? What is the fate of the thinking, feeling, reasoning human family organization? That's an important thing for us to think about. There are some other characteristics of, of this uh, artificial uh, society. First, in many of these societies, the family unit is comprised of a core nuclear family members, mother, father and siblings. This is a rule rather than the exception. So nuclear family, and now we have drugs available for us to control our families. Uh, so. It appears that the trend now is for us to go into these things. It's going to happen to us. Secondly, many people in such societies prefer not to have families. Why? Because the family is going to interfere with their jobs. And it's going to affect a lot of what they wanted to do themselves. So. And thirdly, Advancement in modern medicine and technology is greatest in artificial societies. So, through various inventions and achievements in modern medicine and technology, we now have enabling mechanisms since the opportunity to either have the natural... Oh, we talk about this. We talk about tested babies. And we also talk about uh, uh, clones if cloning happens. So a short century ago, for example, I, I don't even know what artificial insemination is. I don't even know what uh, uh, sperm bank is. I have no concept of all of these things. Now I know them and I'm sure a lot of you have heard about it or heard about that. So the point that I would make is that this trend is here to stay, I, I believe, and uh, we need to be prepared for that. Uh, and again, I think the important question for us as far as it relates to the family member is what is going to happen to the fate, what is the fate of the father-mother siblingship uh, relationship? Are these things, external things, going to affect us? And as we use the example of a clone, clone individual, that individual may not be able to relate to a father as we know a father, or a mother as we know it. So I think those are the 
important things that I want to point out. But let me ask you, are we kind of getting some characteristics of the artificial societies that we have? Like what? You mean? The question is, are we, I list down the characteristics of uh, an artificial society, you know, artificial in question mark. Uh, are we getting some of those? I mean, many of us are getting up at 8 o'clock and we go to work, right? We spend more time out there than, than our, our children, right? Many of us on a daily basis are communicating with machines communicate with machine. So yeah, we're getting some, some of them. Uh, we're, we're going to, I, I wouldn't say, this is the trend, we're into it, and we must remember that you have to every now and then stop and think about, get some self-knowledge, you know, in some societies, I've, I've seen people doing yoga, right? Mm -hmm. I've seen some people just sitting down there and apparently empty their mind. Get rid of everything from it. Just have a blank one. So that you can actually get some something original, something creative in there or, or whatever. But we don't have it anyway. All I do on a daily basis is get up, go to work and then think. Well, maybe I'll go fishing tomorrow or something of that nature. But, uh, you know, I get up in the morning, I still have the same problems that I had the previous day. I have to finish this report uh, because it needs to be finished. I have to do this and that and that. Uh, I didn't have any chance to empty my brain uh, to think about other things. Uh, so, let me end here and uh, see if you have any questions and if there is anything that we can uh, talk more about. I'm sorry that I today I talk about something that is outside of my expertise. My expertise is archaeology, bones, artifacts. <laughs> but but I think uh, challenges with the family is is something for all. All of us should think about. It. Because it is changing, and we need to put some control. Any questions or anything that you may want to? Yeah, you seem to think about you. You seem to be thinking about a very hard question. Uh, I I think. The aspirations of the majority of young people, maybe most of you who are at the college, is to get out and get into the cash economy, get some job, get something to do, uh, to earn a living, um, and forget about other things. Uh, I would, um, I will, I will not even suggest that uh, we revive the extended family. I think the trend we're going, or the pace we're going now, is, is going to be what, what happens in the future. That is, uh, but uh, don't get married to members of your class. <laughs> uh, <those> are, <laughs> Well, it's something for you to think about. I have copies of the paper if you would like to uh, get a copy. I don't have copies of this book. I still need to. By the way, I, I compiled the information in this. Actually came out of uh, a book that was written, published in 1944 by a Japanese anthropologist who is working here. Uh, I don't know how long. Do you know how long? Dr. Imanish. Uh, it's all written in Japanese, but I have a friend 
Dr. Katawaka, who helped me translate some of the kinship charts. So I know at least the name of the people who are in the chart. So some days I will finish that. So who are who are the the Bunban my people from here? You? Come we? Hey Sang Madalani the Sang. Madalani. Bunban Yang the Long Nana Lan Mara. All the Bunban my people, you know, are in line for the High Chief, Isipa Madalani. Not all members of the Bunban Mahara. <laughs> Well, I'm glad that you people know, at least two of you or three of you know your class from Chuk, from the other islands of Chuk. Um, there are some from East, Pengala, Mokilla, Kirilas, that have been translated into Boropen. Okay, the name of their clans discussed here after one or two generations. For example, one uh, Marshallese clan, members of that clan now officially claim they are members of the Lipitan, Lipitan clan. Hey, hey. Hey, come here. Hey, hey. Yeah. Which I know it's Marshallese. Yeah, it is. And the other one is the Bakwa. The Bakwa, right? That's the Gilberts. Kiribas. Even though. Uh, Sapato people claim it came from Sapato. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. We always say, no, no, no. The Bagua, you people are from Kiribati. Uh, apparently, the name for shark is the Bagua. Kiribati, Kiribati, but I'm not sure. Okay, well, thank you for coming, and we'll see you again soon. <laughs>